Good morning, Friendship Baptist Church. On this fourth Sunday of February, the last Sunday of the month, we would um, like for you to be aware that this is Heart Health Month, also the ending of that, as well as Black History Month. Heart health is crucial in the African-American community, and I just would like to leave you several tips to realize in order to have a healthy heart, because it's something that um, many African-Americans um, experience heart disease. One of them is 10 minutes, only 10 minutes of physical activity daily is something that will reduce your um, 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 chances of heart attack. Less stress, try to reduce stress and control what you can by counting your blessings. Also, less screen time. Less screen time on the phone or computers or your electronic devices will reduce the sedentary lifestyle, sedentary lifestyle and would also help you um, to just make your heart more active. Eat more fruits whole grains and vegetables, and also stop drinking your calories. Um, diet drinks and sugary drinks are not good as far as um, they increase your chances for heart disease. Those are just things that, that I would like to share for a heart healthy month for this month. Sunday school lesson books are available for pickup. You can pick them up next door in the, in the administration office during the week. Also, Friendship Baptist Church is joining in the state, South Carolina statewide prison ministry efforts. The goal is to fill 100 bags with the following items, a bar of soap, toothbrush, and toothpaste. And make sure they're individually wrapped and you just drop them off during the week or between now and April 2nd um, to the admin office so that they can be bagged up and I'm sure volunteers will be needed for those efforts. Your kind and thoughtful expression of sympathy is deeply appreciated and gratefully acknowledged for the beautiful flowers and that is coming from Sister Margie Allen Jones and family in the passing of her mother. Please check out our Facebook page and our website. Pastor Edwards has a tentative schedule for the return for Friendship Baptist Church for in-person in worship service. Depending on the COVID-19 numbers reported by the CDC, Friendship Baptist Church is scheduled to open its doors on the first Sunday in April. That'll be April 3rd, 2022. More details. For more details, please view the video message by our Pastor Edwards on what to expect upon returning. If you were born in the month of February, we would like to say happy birthday for you, that God has blessed you, allowed you to see another birthday. Thank you, friendship, and have a great week. Today's lesson is entitled Serving a Just God. It comes from the book of Job, chapter 42, verses 1 through 6, and then verses 10 through 17. Our lessons come from the book of Job. Any Christian, I am sure, knows the story of Job. Job is a book that focuses on God's arrangement with Satan concerning Job, concerning Job the man, and his many trials and suffering the responses of his wife and friends, and the loss of his wealth and health, and Job's steadfastness toward God. God's presence, not, not, 
not answers to questions proved to be what Job needed. We look today at Job after his three friends stopped talking, his wife stopped talking, finally God stopped talking. Then it was celebration time. Our aim today in a lesson is by the end of this lesson, we will understand the necessity of being humble before God. We will appreciate uh, how God listens to our thoughts and responds with justice and help others see the justice of God in different situations. In our In Focus story, we have a, we have a story about a woman who has just been let out of prison. She claims that she had, had done nothing wrong. Uh, she was around a group of people who had done wrong. And she said the police officer planted some weed on her and arrested her with the others for that she got six years in prison. Now, having a bad record, which, which would make it twice as hard to land a job, uh, no money, now nowhere to stay, she finds herself desperate. Coming out of prison with nothing, you, you will find that those who were your friends before now avoid you because you have nothing. As things will happen, she walked by her church where they were having Bible study. She decided to go in. She, she was welcomed by the pastor who recognized her from the past, gave her a hug, uh, offered to her uh, to help her just find just after Bible study. After the pastor in the next few weeks helped her get a job, a place to stay, and got Carrie back in school. <clears throat> when things pile up and you have no out, you can always go to the church, which is a hospital for those who are injured. That is a Christian service to mankind. Now getting into our lesson, the first outline is verses one through three, and it's, it's titled God's Wisdom and Counsel. It reads, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withheld from thee. Who is, the, who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore, have I uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me, which I knew not? Notice it says then, which, is, which in the phrase means that the Lord had had just finished dressing Job down. He says to, to the Lord that he is almighty, that you even know what I think. You ask, who is that uh, who had his counsel without knowledge? I told you that I did not understand. Those things were too wonderful for me. I just did not know. We see now that Job is very humble. God has just brought him down to earth, showing him the flaw in his thinking, thinking that he knows everything. The second outline is Job's humanity. Here I beseech thee, and I will, I will speak, and I will demand of thee and declare thy unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine ear seeth thee. Wherefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Now Job says, listen, please, and, and let me speak. Uh, you said I will question you, and you should answer me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I abhor, that is, regard and disgust for myself and repent in dust and ashes. That's like saying, my eyes have seen the coming of the Lord, and I am sorry that I had the audacity to question you. Lord, have mercy. The second outline uh, 
comes from uh, uh, verses 10 and 11. I don't think so. <clears throat> verses 4 through, through 8. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak, I will demand of thee, and declare thy unto me. I have heard of thee by hearing of the ear, ear but now my eye seeth. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job uh, when he prayed for his friends, who the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then came there unto him all his brethren and all his sisters and all they that had been, <coughs> been of his acquaintance before and did eat bread with him in his house. And they bemoaned him and confronted him over all the e evil that the Lord had brought upon him. Every man also gave him a piece of money and every one an earring of gold. And the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. He had to, he had to forgive his friends before the Lord would restore all of his losses. Then the Lord gave, uh, you see, God gave Job justice for all of the suffering and all of the losing, uh, his status in society. Now, all who had witnessed his suffering came to his house and did eat with him. Uh, they bemoaned, that is, expressed discomfort, sorry for him, and they consoled him and co comforted him for all the adversity that the Lord had brought upon him. Each one gave him a piece of silver and each a ring of gold. Now he was worldly and spiritually rich. Verses, next, next outline, which is the final one, uh, is God's uh, faithfulness in adversity. Verses 12 through 17. And they read, So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job, more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 she asses. He had also seven sons and three daughters, and he called the name of the first, Jeb my own, and the name of the second, Kibzibi, and the name of the third, ker and, and in all the land, there were no women found so fair as his daughters of Job. And their father gave them an inheritance among their brethren. After he, this lived Job 140 years and saw his sons and his sons and sons even four generations. So Job died being old and full of days. If getting Job out of the ashes was not a worth, God blessed Job more in his latter, latter time than the beginning. God just kept blessing Job. He, had, he blessed him with wealth, just 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of ox, and 1,000 female donkeys. <clears throat> Status. He then got three daughters, Jeremiah, Ki Pai, and the third was named Ker Iha Puk. No other woman was as beautiful as these three daughters. He also gave Job long life. Job lived to 140 years and saw his children and grandchildren for four generations. The, the names of Job's three daughters represent symbols of beauty and love. The J-Mai-O, turtle dove, and ki pai -o, and aromatic spice, and ker ha -puk, a black powder used in eye cosmetics. The three names represent hearing, seeing, and sight. As you can see, there were not many, that, there were not just any old names, they were special names for special daughters. Job, Job had it all. Wealth, status, long life. Ain't God just? 
there can be no better justicing than the Lord's justice. The, name, the same God is still on the throne. As he has done for Job, he will do for you. No matter how bad, how difficult, how impossible things look. As far as for Job, he never gave up on his love of God. If you trust him, he stands ready to give you justice. Thank you. Good morning, friendship. My name is Loretta Williams, and I will be presenting today's Children's Church lesson. Today's Children's Church lesson will be coming from Psalm 23, verses 2 through 3, and Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. Our Bible point is, God gives us rest. Psalm 23, verses 2 through 3 states, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path. We will learn in these powerful verses from Psalms 23 that our shepherd is God. God lets us rest in green meadows and leads us beside peaceful streams. Matthew 11, 28 through 30 states, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and will find, you will find rest for your soul. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus makes a similar promise when he invites us to take our birds to him and find rest. God gives us rest. The rest that Jesus offers is rest from worries, stresses, and troubles that overwhelm us. In this bag, we're going to explore some of the challenges that our young people are facing today. The first one is isolation. Our young people have been isolated from their friends, and they have been isolated from um, relatives, grandparents, and this has been a stressor on them because they haven't been able to visit. They haven't been able to have communal dinners together. So it has been a, proved to be a stressor. Parents, young people just feel that their parents don't understand them, that they're misunderstood. They, their parents just don't get it. And sometimes that can cause them to feel very, very anxious because they feel like their parents are not hearing them and that they're just, um, they're out there by themselves because their parents do not understand. They don't just, they just don't, un we understand, but they don't feel that we understand. Our next stressor is going to be COVID. And that has, been a, that has proven to be a stressor for all of us because we are constantly worried about contracting COVID, someone in our family contracting COVID. So COVID has been a major, a major stressor for our young people. Friends. We haven't been able to interact with our friends the way that we would like to. Young people like to socialize, and they haven't been able to do that. They haven't been able to do that at all. They have been isolated from their friends. And as a, because they've been isolated from their friends, it has caused them to stress a little bit. Grades. Grades are a major stressor because what is happening is we're either trying to um, fix our grades, we're trying to maintain our grades. So grades are a major, major stressor for our young people. And last but not least, we have virtual learning. Virtual learning has been a pill for our young people, our parents, and some grandparents. 
because let's face it, we don't always, the young people haven't always wanted to get up and log on. So it is, virtual learning has proved to be a major, major stressor for a lot of young people. How do you rest from your burdens? I'm glad you asked. The Bible is one way God helps you to find peace and rest. Through prayer, praying from the heart allows God to guard your heart and mind against your burdens. There are always going to be responsibilities and troubles in your lives that no human can help you with, but you can still turn to Jesus for help. God gives you rest. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for giving our young people rest. We ask you to give them rest from their burdens and renew their strengths. Father, help our young children to trust in you so that they may find peace and rest in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week. Be blessed and be well. seen that with me this morning. I love you. I love you. I love you, Lord, today because you care for me in such a special way. That's why I praise you. I lift you up and I magnify your name. Oh, that's why my heart is filled with praise. Come on, tell it my heart. My heart, my mind, my soul belongs to you. You paid the price for me. Way back on Calvary. That's why I praise you. I lift you up and I magnify your name. Hey, that's why my heart is filled with praise. Come on, let's sing it again. My heart, my mind, my soul belongs to you. You paid the price for me way back on Calvary. That's why I praise you. I lift you up and I magnify your name. Nay, that's why my heart is filled with praise. If you don't mind lifting your voice with me. I love you. I love you. I love you, Lord, today. Because you care for me. In such a special way. That's why I praise you. I lift you up. And I magnify your name. Lord, while my heart is filled with praise. Lord, my heart, my mind, my very soul belongs to you. You paid the price for me way back on Calvary. That's why I praise you. I lift you up and I magnify your name. 
That's why my heart is filled. That's why my heart is filled. That's why my heart is filled. Lord, that's why my heart is filled. That's why my heart is filled with praise. 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 Good morning, friendship, family, and friends. Today, as you know, we have the opportunity to talk with Dr. Trial Harris, our very own Aiken native. She has her own place in Black history. Because of that, I highlighted her last year during Black History Month of 2021. Dr. Irene Trowell Harris has a lot of firsts in her career. She was the first woman and nurse to command a medical clinic. The first black woman in the history of the National Guard to become a general officer. She also is the first to have a mentoring award named after her, as well as a Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated chapter named in her honor. She loved to fly and took every assignment and opportunity afforded to her to serve her country as a flight nurse. So much, in fact, that she racked up the most flight hours of any nurse that was in her unit. To her, just getting by wasn't an option. She desperately wanted to excel and to continue learning. Her assignment took her all over the world, from Alaska to all of Europe. But her favorite flights were flying patients from Germany to the United States. Good morning, Dr. Trial Harris. Good morning and thank you for having me. Wonderful, and thank you also for taking the time out of your day to share a little of yourself with us. I do have a, several questions I want to ask, and as you talk to us and let us to get to know you a little better and all the accomplishment that you have. So the first question I'd like to ask you is that it has been recorded that you saw a plane <laughs> flying overhead while you were out in the cotton field as a little girl. And right then in that moment, you told your brothers and sisters that you were going to teach and you were going to work in an airplane. So tell me, what fascinated you about airplanes at such a young age? And tell us a little bit about your childhood in Aiken. Well, we were out in the cotton field on my, with my 10 brothers and sisters. I was about 13 years old. And I saw this airplane flying over the cotton field. The sound, that white contrail, and that beautiful sight. And for some reason I said, one day I will work and teach on an airplane. Of course, my brothers and sisters laughed because they said, what you need right now is a psychiatrist because there's no way someone low income minority is going to be up there anytime soon. Believe it or not, 10 years later, I had completed nursing school and gone to flight nurse school at the Aerospace School of Medicine flight nurse branch in San Antonio, Texas and graduated with those silver flight wings. That was one of my most proudest accomplishments. Now, growing up in Aiken on the cotton field, uh, you know, we worked hard every day. We even worked half of Saturdays. And in the afternoon, we had to do the chores around the house, like cleaning and washing, things like that. But it was a very difficult, yet interesting, yet rewarding experience. I, we spent our Sundays most of the day in church at the Mahill 
Missionary Baptist Church there, not far from Aiken. But anyway, when I was getting ready to uh, graduate from high school, um, I said to my house mother at the church one Sunday, I'm an honor student. Uh, I participated in extracurricular activities. I would like to go to nursing school, but my parents does not have the money. She said, let me speak to the minister and then I'll talk to your mother. The very next Sunday, she said to my mother, I want to talk to you about us collecting some funding for your daughter. That Sunday, they passed a little wicker basket around to collect money for my first year of nursing school. In that little basket, there was dimes, quarters, and nickels, not one paper dollar. I needed $60, and believe it or not, there was $62.25 of change <laughs> in that basket. And that is how I got the opportunity to go to nursing school. Think about it. The church provided the bridge for me from the cotton field to nursing school to Jersey City for the bachelor's, master's at Yale, and a doctorate at Columbia and two stars. So again, you understand why I'm so dedicated to helping others and giving back uh, because of that. And after that, it was all going forward. And it was just wonderful. And I want to just point out that it was not about me. It was about helping my family, my parents, my brothers and sisters. So I was really dedicated to getting my education. But at the same time, I had to help my brothers and sisters financially and my parents while I was also, you know, working. So again, it's a family affair and we help each other. And I'll explain later on how that expanded to helping the church also, though. That's Thank such you. a beautiful story. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you earned a bachelor's degree from Jersey City College and also a master's from Yale University and a doctorate from Columbia University. So how was college life and what course of study did you pursue? Well, my first course of study, I already had my nursing diploma, nursing degree, but I went back to New Jersey City University to get the bachelor's. And there I did some special work in getting that degree with school nursing and looking at policy issues. But when I was going to school there, I worked full time in New York City and drove over to New Jersey with three of my friends. Uh, we worked together. That really made it very easy. It was kind of challenging, though. And I must say, uh, when I was getting ready to graduate from New Jersey City University, one of my professors said to me, you know, you ought to go on and get a master's degree. You know, you got great grades, you participated. So I thought, I don't know whether I, I want to do that or not. But they said, no, go check the bulletin board. There's several flyers there for master's degree. I did that. There was a flyer there for Yale, and that's how I got the Yale. <laughs> now, when I got that scholarship, when I went to Yale, I applied for a public health scholarship received a full scholarship for tuition at Yale and a stipend for two years to get the master's degree. And that was fairly challenging because think about it, going up, going to school in South Carolina, we probably didn't have the strongest and the best classes, you know, are there. So what I did when I went up to um, New Haven, I immediately took a course in advanced statistics just to make sure when I looked at that agenda, there was a lot of statistics on there. I love algebra, algebra and all the other things, but so I want to make sure because I was working part time when I was there. I was still flying part time with the National Guard. I want to make sure I wanted to do my very best. Just getting by was not not an option, but I want to do my very best and be one of one of their best students, though. But it was a wonderful experience there, though. Wonderful. I, I guess they are on Columbia. So when I was getting ready to leave Yale, they said, you know, you ought to go and get a doctorate. <laughs> so I decided to return to New York, though, and I did go to Columbia University and graduated there with the, the doctorate degree there, mainly looking at health care and policy issues, though. Wonderful. Were, were there any challenges, um, ac both academic or being an African-American female when you were in school? 
I think when I, um, at New Jersey City University, not really, when I went to Yale, the number of minority students were very small. But I guess the good thing, which was sent from above, like that plane flying over the cotton field, when I walked to Yale to, to interview and have questions, a nurse met me at the door and said, we we'll welcome you here and we're glad to see you here. But it was a Caucasian nurse, a man, professor. So that immediately made me feel very, 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 very comfortable, you know, having met this, this particular person. Then the second interview I went on at the university, there was a lady there, a professor, who was going to be writing a book about Medicaid, Medicare, and home care. And I had excessive experience in that field. So she said, I want you to help me write a book, collect some information for me. So because of those two people, I felt very comfortable and all during my two years there, I worked in teams and worked with groups and I, I felt very, very comfortable. But it was again because of those folks who kind of took me under their wings and that both became my, my uh, when I had to write my little book and my do my little work there, they were both my advisors. So that's what made it very easy for me though, yes. That is wonderful. So tell us um, about your experiences in the Vietnam War. Uh, you well, volunteered, I, I'm sorry, uh -huh. you volunteered to go as a flight nurse, but you weren't able to go. So what assignments were you able to serve? Well, what happened is during the Vietnam War area time, uh, I volunteered to go as, as a flight nurse to take care of the patients, et cetera. But at the time they told me, we don't want female flight nurses. We only want the male flight nurses to go. So I said, okay, well, I'll just, you know. So what I happened to end up doing is um, I stayed in the unit in New York. I became a flight nurse instructor, let on become a flight nurse examiner, then an assistant chief nurse, and then a chief nurse, and laid on a hospital commander. So I used my time to keep studying academically and to move up professionally. Wonderful, wonderful. You know, tell us about your accomplishments that propelled you to become the first African-American woman to become Major General in the United States National Guard. <laughs> I think um, it, it's, it's my entire uh, list of experience becoming a nurse. Our nurses were needed all over the place, not just for taking care of patients, but for flight duty, uh, teaching at flight school, et cetera, though. So I pursued all those opportunities, uh, becoming a flight nurse instructor, then an examiner. I gave some classes at the flight school. I mentored students my entire a career. And when I uh, had done, I was on flying status for about 13 years. Then I became an assistant chief nurse, then a chief nurse. And at, during that time also, I did become the commander for the medical unit. That meant being responsible for about 67 people. And the mission was to keep those C-5A Jimbo jets flying all over the world, you know, with the health care, the policy issues, things like that. So after that assignment, I was uh, offered a position in the Air Force Surgeon General's office in Washington, D.C. to be the, the Air National Guard advisor, the chief nurse and assistant surgeon general. So once I got there, I participated in numerous committees, policies, gave advice, mentored students, uh, did some research work with the research department there. And one day I was sitting in the office at Bowling Air Force Base and got a phone call from the Pentagon. So they said, well, your name is on the general officer list. And I didn't even know what that was at the time. So they said, with all your experience to education, your name came up to be promoted from full colonel to brigadier general, which had to go through a long process of filling out forms and interviews. So I, I did that. A few months later, I got the call saying, you were selected, you're gonna be promoted to brigadier general. And that was, I was in shock. <laughs> Because even during that time, think about the number of people that are in the military. Uh, and when notices were so few, still being selected was really just wonderful, though. And I soon uh, went to the Pentagon, I got my painting at the Pentagon, 
and I have photos of that. <laughs> it was just great. And after that, I was an advisor to the National Guard director and the Air Force Surgeon General. And that's how I got there. But it was education, mentoring, doing the research work, all of those things are together. Exactly, though. Thank you. Wonderful. Actually, um, when I highlighted you last year, I um, had pictures that were, came up on the screen of you getting pinned. Um, uh -huh you know, as as a major general in the United States National Guard. So we have seen those pictures okay. that you're talking about. And yes. we are so very proud. Such a wonderful accomplishment. So you retired from the Air National Guard in 2001 as major general, but you continued as the director of the Department of Veteran Affairs Center for Women Veterans from 2001 to 2013. What was the nature of your duties when you were in that director role? Well, I was selected then uh, to be uh, the top person for the Center for Women Veterans, advising the secretary of VA. That's on all policies, uh, issues, taking care of problems, et cetera, though. And as part of that, you had to be a political appointee. So I was an appointee for Bush for eight years and Obama for five years uh, doing policy. And this, it was really challenging because the women at that time, they were reluctant to kind of go to the VA. They didn't really understand some of the policies and some say they were not treated exactly like the other military people were. So we had to look at everything, the policy, uh, how people were treated, look at different you know, uh, avenues, and we were able to do something that had not been done. That was to get to work with the secretary, the Congress and the VA to get a women veterans program manager assigned to every major medical center to take care of those women veterans. Everything, they're gonna have policy issues, health care, whatever you needed, they were there to help you. So that really did help a lot. So that was one of, one of my major accomplishments, but I must say this was done because I had very competent, very dedicated staff. And that's how I was really able to get that, you know, that get that done. And um, I had to go to Congress a couple of times to explain things. And, you know, they, you know, asked me a lot of questions and I answered the questions. If there was a question that was not within my responsibility, oh, I didn't have the answer, I said, I will check on that, follow up and get back to you. I just made it very clear. <laughs> and, and that's what I had, you know, done though. But it was a wonderful experience. And I'm still in contact with uh, the people there, uh, looking at policy issues and some of the things that I do every day though. Absolutely though. And, and, and that leads into my next question. Um, today, you continue to advise, uh, you mentor, you motivate both service members and civilians on a host of topics. You've also written two books of memoirs. One is called The Sky High, No Goal is Out of Your Control, which was published in 2009. And this, uh, the second book, Bridges, A Life Building and Crossing Them, which was published in 2015. You also have been quoted to say, I want to help and touch as many people as I can in my life. Please expand on your current projects. It's what I do now is I'm looking at basically policy issues. I'm doing this through my congressional members, um, through committees, through board of directors. But what I wanted to was look at the policy issues that takes care of the people. That includes health care, uh, voting rights, uh, child tax credit, um, uh, uh, things like uh, student loan forgiveness, uh, mentoring, but working with groups and policy committees is one of the greatest way of getting things done. But this is about, it's not about us personally, it's about getting things done for the people. And my career has basically been defined by leadership, collaboration, and mentoring. So a lot of these policies that we do, you have to collaborate. You know, you have to talk to people. You can disagree, that's okay, but it's about taking care of the people. And it's also about taking care of our families, our churches and things like that. 
it could be very frustrating sometimes, but I'm very adamant and, I'm, and I stick to it. <laughs> so I spend many hours uh, working on policy issues with numerous committees. And those issues are nursing, regular policy, veterans issues, and military issues, because these things are ongoing and we need experienced people who understand the system to help them actually uh, update, revise, and, and, and do the policy, because things do change. You know, for example, with COVID-19, a lot of things had to change. So we have to change the way that we do business, but we still have to take care of, of people. So again, it's about, I was a mentor. Think about the opportunity I was given with the church, all my universities, the military. So what I'm doing is really using my experience to give back what was given to me. And I want to do this now. And the things that I'm doing, I want to make those in perpetuity to stay there even after I'm, I'm gone. So again, I'm very dedicated to the policy issues though. Wonderful. And you know, you talked about, you know, how fortunate you were uh, to have the support of the church and other uh, individuals in your life. And you've written two books. So what may motivated you to write them? And what is the audience that you wanted to reach in those two books? Okay, I'll start with the audience because um, the first book mainly looks at my accomplishments, uh, how people helped me. You saw on that front cover, there's a cotton field at the bottom and there's that jet plane flying over the cotton field. And at the top is my two stars. <laughs> but initially I want to reach young people, junior high school, high school, but I don't want it to stop there. I want to reach professionals, uh, people in grad school, because we all can experience we, we all can improve ourselves. So I look at the person and say, now, where are you now? Where would you like to go? And I may have some ideas on suggesting how you may get there. So again, I want to reach all different ages. As a matter of fact, my Tessica to Airman chapter starts out at uh, kids that six years old. So, and we mentor all the way through, you know, college, flight school, things like that. So I, don't, I don't really don't want to limit it, you know, really. But writing the book though was, uh, the first one was a, a real joy. Uh, I want to help people to understand, no matter how uh, low income you're from, where you're from, uh, what you've been involved with, you can be successful. I took it step by step and I just applied myself. I, I collaborated, I talked to people, I, I seek advice. So that book kind of covers all of those kinds of things and tell where I started out, where, where I ended up, but not stop there, how I also help others along the way, my brothers and sisters. For example, one of my younger brothers joined the Air Force. Uh, he went on, he was a flight physician and he just loved the Air Force. He had flight wings too. A very younger brother went to Aeronautical uh, University in Florida, became a pilot. He was a private pilot. I have several sisters and brothers that are, you know, that are nurses of small business, but we help each other. It's just not about me. As we all came successful, we help each other. So the first book was mainly about the family and helping each other, but also giving advice on uh, stepping up. The second book, I expanded that a little bit more. It's not enough just to cross a bridge. We all need to build bridges for others. And that's what the church did for me. That's what the university did for me. So what I was doing is building bridges for others. That's the reason I established those up to five scholarship programs. Uh, they named the trustee chapter after me in New York. That's for the uh, STEM students and for the flying students. So all these things that I'm giving back. And I just want to point out two special areas though. Uh, my here Mission at Baptist Church, they started a scholarship there on me. I think that's been going on for like 35 or 40 years now, but it's every year. And when my mother passed away in 2008, she loved the Historic Museum in Aiken. So we established a memorial fund there for her this is to educate the kids around Aiken to come to the library to find out about history, about minorities, and about the military. 
and those things are still going on at the military uh, at the uh, museum. And my Yale uh, alumni chair is at the Aiken County Historical Museum. You can go look at it, but you can't sit in it. <laughs> it's there to inspire and motivate the kids around there to say, if she could do that way back then, I can do this and more. So again, it's to inspire. And with the second book also, I found out that many families have medical uh, illness histories and they never really discuss it with the family. So I started publishing every month, every year, a list of all the illnesses and diseases in the family, advising men to get the test they need, women to get the test they need, and to take care of your health, really, and take care of your kids. So it's an educational uh, book uh, also, things that we all can do to stay healthy. And this has been very, very valuable to my family along the way, you know, too, though. But I enjoyed writing the books. Uh, I happened to find a publisher that mainly published military type books. So he understood what I had had, had gone through and gave me a lot of great advice. But uh, I think the two books are in the library also at the Aiken County Historical like Museum. But it's the, I want to inspire people, let them know no matter where are you starting out, you can really go very, very high, you know, sky high. No goal is out of your reach, really. And once you get there, you cross the bridge, but you look back and you start building bridges for others to pass over to for success. Absolutely. That is so inspiring. And I am an avid reader. And uh, you have inspired me and motivated me to purchase your books <laughs> so that I can read them and see what I can do to uh, inspire others and to build bridges for others to cross also. So that is that is very um very uh, in touching uh, th these books that you've written. Uh, and I look forward to reading them. And I will definitely uh, let you know when I have done that. <laughs> and, uh, and I'll give you some conversation about these books. Um, is there anything that you else you'd like to expand on as far as the Tuskegee, um, the Tuskegee chapter that is named after you? Well, it's in uh, uh, Newburgh, New York, and for 24 years, we have been mentoring students and giving scholarships. I think the president told me we had mentored at least 306, uh, 360 students. We've given out, I think, 240 scholarships there. Uh, but it is, uh, we start at sixth grade and go all the way through high school. So we have partnerships in the area, though, that help us run these programs for all different ages, though. Uh, one of the primary things we want students to do is to look at the aviation field, STEM, medicine, nursing, law, whatever. So we don't limit it just to pilots. They can go in any of those areas. If you see, I have a website, you'll see almost all of the graduates are online. They have their history there, tell you where they went, what they've done. And a lot of these students come back to us as pilots. We have a couple of young ladies that are attorneys that are advising us, which, which is wonderful. So again, um, we still mentor the ones that would like to be mentored after they leave. And like I said, they they give back, you know, also though. So uh, that is something that, uh, that, that, they be, that we really like. And just so I think I pointed out that the Red Tail Flight Academy started because of that chapter. It's just separate, but it is mainly for pilots. You might have seen on um, ABC the other day, they had a, a little, little uh, five minute section on there saying, we want to diversify the sky. So that flight school is mainly trying to uh, get young women and men of color involved with flying. So again, we have been so blessed. And um, hopefully one of these days that uh, we can invite you all to come up for a graduation or an open house so you can actually see the place though. Exactly though, right, yeah. I just want to point out one other thing about being at that cotton field experience. I tried to figure out for years, why would a 13 year old make that statement? And somebody told me that was probably a calling from above for you. You didn't know that at the time, but that was my life assignment being given to me. And I didn't even know that way back then. So again, I think that's what kept me going too, though, that I was given an assignment. 
And I definitely want to do my very, very, very best with that. That is wonderful. And in support of this tremendous service that you're doing for our youth and for our adults, Friendship Baptist Church will donate $200 to the Major General Irene Trow Harris Chapter of Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated for student tuition assistance. Thank you so much. That is fabulous though. Thank you so much. And we are so very proud of you. Um, and we're so very inspired by you. Is there anything before we conclude this interview? Is there anything else that you'd like to share with us? I think uh, for you, any other people that may be listening, think about writing a book to self. Uh, you just start it. You start by making notes and uh, just just do life chapter by chapter, do high school, college, marriage, et cetera, and take note. Before you know it, you have enough information to write a book. And I'd be glad to advise you too. So <laughs> that's what I want. <laughs> but Thanks. again, I'm just so proud of what you all are doing um, and what you're doing. So again, thank you and to your, the church and all for having me. And uh, hopefully when the virus is a little bit safer, I want to come down to visit the church. Wonderful. Thank you so much for taking out some time um, to uh, talk with us, to share a little bit of you with us. And uh, you're our home girl. So we're <laughs> yes. always interested. And I will definitely keep the church informed um, about um, your your aspirations and your programs. So thank you so much again, Dr. Trowell Harris, for spending some time with us. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Keep on talking to me. Keep on talking to me, Jesus. Keep on talking to me. Speak to my heart, Holy Spirit. Give me the words that will bring new life. Words on the wings of the morning. The dark clouds will fade away and speak to my heart. Speak to my heart, Holy Spirit, message of love to encourage me. Lifting my heart from despair, how you love me and care for me. To speak to my heart, speak to my heart, Holy Spirit, give me the words that will bring new life, words on the wings of the morning, the dark clouds will fade away, to speak to my heart. To my heart, Holy Spirit, message of love to encourage me, lifting my heart from despair. How you love me and care for me to speak to my heart, speak to my heart. Just let your spirit guide me 
and let your word abide. Speak to my heart, Lord. Give me your holy word. If I can't hear from you, then I know what to do. I won't go alone. I'll never go on my own. Just let your spirit guide me and let your word abide. Speak to my heart, Lord. Give me your holy word. If I can't hear from you, then I know what to do. I won't go alone. I'll never go on my own. Just let your spirit guide me and let your word abide. Speak to my heart, Lord. Good morning. Welcome to another worship service here at the Friendship Baptist Church in beautiful downtown Aiken, South Carolina. There is a word from the Lord this morning, and I pray that you have your Bible. And turn with me to 1 Peter chapter number 1, and I shall be reading verses 13 through 16, and I shall be reading the New International Version of the Scripture. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 13 through 16. You'll find these words. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy... So be holy in all you do, 
for it is written, be holy because I am holy. Uh, this morning, I want to use as a food for thought called to be holy, called to be holy. Verse 16 says, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. You know, people, places or things uh, that are different from the everyday norms of life stand out. And people will often point those things out. They will take notice of things that stands out. Usually when it comes to people, most people want to blend in with the crowd. Uh, not many folks want to draw attention to themselves. Uh, most want to be considered as ordinary, everyday people. When we really think about it, blending in as ordinary, everyday people is simply blending in with the world. That seemed to be so simple and easy to do. You see, living by worldly standards, we can find examples or role models for that all around us. We can find it within our own family and family members. We can find it at home. We can find it in our churches, in our community, on jobs in which we work in, on TV. We, we can find worldly examples every, everywhere. Learning how to live a life that will allow us to blend in perfectly with the world will not be difficult to do because we are born to fit in perfectly with the world. Why? Because we are born with a nature that desires to live worldly, and that nature must be tamed. Yes, and notice what the Apostle Paul says about the nature man is born with. In his letter to Rome, to the Romans, chapter 7, verse 18, he penned these words. He says, for, for I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Here it is. Here it is. The Apostle Paul, one of the greatest writers in the uh, New Testament, declares huh, that, 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 that good itself does not dwell within him. In other words, he says, in that sinful nature, that nature that he was born with. And so with all men, it is the same. If we go look at a Psalm of David right there in Psalm 51.5, it says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. King David, King David declares that our sinful nature was developed in the womb. We are born with a nature that has to be tamed or train. Uh, that sinful nature will, will allow us to easily blend in with the world without much coaching or teaching. Look at what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 8, 5 and 8. He says, those who live according to the sinful nature have their mind set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. You know, just right there in that one verse alone, notice Paul declares man desires what is in him, that nature that we're born with, that sinful nature. Uh, man is driven by what is in him. Man is controlled by what is in him. Man has a case of I can't help myself with the nature that we're born with. Uh, this birth nature we have allows us to blend in with the world easily without much effort because of the nature that is born in this uh, creature called man. Yes, God who cre created us knows about this defect and imperfection or, or lack that causes failure still calls all men Huh? To holy living. We are called to be different in a world where men and women are dying daily. Let's look at our background just for 
uh, a minute here to help us out. Uh, the scriptures that we're looking at today, the, the, the writer, the author is the, the apostle Peter. Peter was one who walked with Christ. Peter was one who was ready to defend. Peter was one who was ready to fight. Peter was one uh, who would stick out in following Jesus Christ. Christians are being persecuted for their beliefs. And so Peter pins a letter to them because Peter wanted them to keep the faith. Peter wanted them to hold on to the hope found only in Christ Jesus. Peter wanted them to live differently in the world. And just as, as Peter was calling the early Christians to be different in the world, we too are being called to be different. In other words, we're called to live holy. Notice in our text, as believers, because we know Christ is coming, we should be uh, motivated to live for him. Yes, and that's all Peter was trying to do in writing. See, we have been called to live a different lifestyle from the world. We have been called to live what we believe. We have been called to live what we testify about. We have been called to live what we sing about. We have been called to live what we pray about. Yeah, we have been called to be different in a world where it is so easy to live like others. We have been called to make a difference in a world where people need to see uh, a different um, role model before them on a daily basis and a role model that is modeled after the word of Christ. So to accomplish, to accomplish this task, yes, it is not easy because every day is not a good day. So how can one get up every day and face the realities of life? and remain pleasing in God's sight. Well, the apostle Peter offers some great advice in our text this morning. How is it that we can go day in and day out? Some days are good days, some days are bad days, some days are sad days, some days are happy days, but yet we're called to live holy despite the condition of how we feel on any given day. Well, Right here, a couple of things that I'm going to share, and I hope you take note. The first thing that, that Peter, Peter let us uh, know in the text, if we look at it well and examine it very well, the first thing is we have to be mentally alert. Well, right there in verse 13, therefore, notice what he says, prepare your minds for action. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. We have to be mentally alert not some of the time, but all the time. You see, uh, the believers did not need to be holy in order to be saved, but they were called to holy living in order to portray God's nature and his grace to an unbelieving world. Obedience does not always come naturally or easily. No, no, that's part of the preparation in living holy is being obedient to the word of God. yes. Uh, the believers would need a new mind, a new mindset. They would have to have a new way of thinking. He says, be self-controlled. Peter tells them to monitor and restrain uh, their sexual and material desires, anger, and words. They needed to discipline themselves. Uh, they had to avoid drunkenness addictions or attitudes that can overwhelm and take control of their minds and bodies. You see, even good things in life can do that to us as well, such as one's career, education, or anything that we pursue that turns us away from God. Yeah, there are some good things that can drive us away from God if we aren't careful to remember that those things can never and should never be our gods. Goes on to say, set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. Yeah, Peter, Peter, he's wanted them to know they were to place all their hope, all of their hope in the promise given to them only through Jesus Christ. Not man, but only through Christ. 
Yes, that unmerited favor, salvation, we receive when we accept him as Lord and Savior. The fullness of salvation with his complete rewards and blessings will be revealed when he, our Lord and Savior, is revealed when he returns. So that's the first thing. The first thing, you've got to be mentally alert. The, the second thing that Peter, uh, I find here in reading the text, we have to be morally disciplined. Look at verse 14. And as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. You see, all believers are part of God's family. There may be many differences among God's children. We will have different characteristics, but we all ought to have one characteristic that is in common, and that is obedience to the word of God. Yes, we, the children of God, the believers, should not be conforming to the evil desires that once controlled us. Yes, when, when, when you lived in ignorance. That, that is what, the way Peter put it, when you lived in ignorance. Ignorance means you didn't know. Ignorance means you didn't know any better. But now that you've been enlightened, now that you know through the word of God, there ought to be a difference. Yes, we have to be morally disciplined. So not only, not only are we to be mentally alert, secondly, we have to be morally disciplined. Uh, but the third thing is we have to be spiritually focused. Look at verse 15. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. But it is written, be holy because I am holy. Yes, God has called all believers to be holy. Holiness for God's people means being totally devoted or dedicated to Christ only. That means you, you've been set aside for his special use. You have been set apart from sin. You have been set free from the influence of sin. Yeah, God is holy and because he is holy, God has called us to be, to be holy. Yes, when you're holy, you are separate from the world. Yeah, the world ought to see a difference in you. You ought to stick out to the world because they ought to see that when you're holy. Yeah, your morals are different from the world morals. Your values differ from the world values. Your purposes may differ. Your goals may differ. All that will be different from the world. We must remember it's not about how well you can sing. It's not about how well you can teach. It's not about how well you can preach. It's not about how well you can even pray. As believers, we are to live our faith in our daily walk of life. Our faith should be seen in our walk. Our faith should be seen in our talk. Our faith should be seen in our behavior. Yes, this morning, I just wanted to let you know that if we exercise true faith and obedience to God's word. Yeah, we can live a holy life. We can live a holy life every day that he allows you and I to get up, to breathe in and out all by ourselves. Yeah, we must remember we've got to stay mentally alert. We've got to stay morally disciplined and we must stay spiritually focused in order to live and be ye holy. God has called all of us, all believers, has nothing to do with titles, has nothing to do with where you serve in the body of Christ. All believers are called to live the same. Yes, Peter, Peter wanted to encourage them that they were called to be holy. To be holy sets us apart from the world. I pray that you've gotten something out of the message this morning. I pray that if you've yet to come to know how to live holy, that you read this text. And as you read this text and read it well, that you understand what it means to be mentally alert, what it means to be morally disciplined, and what it means to be spiritually focused. It takes all of that in order to walk the way God would have us to walk, to talk, the way God would have us to talk and to live the way he desires for us to live. 
Yes, it all begins with accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Believing that he died on an old rugged, rugged cross, was buried in a borrowed tomb, but early one great Sunday morning, he got up with all power and trusted in his hand. The word said, thou shalt be saved. People are dying daily, not knowing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. People are living every day, not knowing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He called all believers to live holy so that believers would be that example to the world. Again, I pray that you've been blessed. And I pray that as you continue to live in the days in which God has allowed not only you and I to live, that we'll live holy. Thank you, Father God, for your word this morning. Thank you for what has been shared. Help us all, God, in ways in which we all stand in need of help. We pray for the loss all over this land and country. And now, God, we're just praying that your Holy Spirit will continue to rest, rule, and abide henceforth with us now and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.